Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Mara Havick, and I'm the provost here at the University of Alaska Southeast. I'm also currently serving as the interim school of education dean. I'm delighted that you have joined us this evening with Dr. Tula Turin for her presentation, It's Not a Miracle, Teacher Education and Teaching in Finland. Before I turn it over to Dr. Hirschberg to introduce Dr. Turin, I'd like to acknowledge that our campuses reside on the unceded territories of the Akwan, Tataquan, and Shikakwan on Lincoln Ani, also known as Juneau, Ketchikan, and Sitka, Alaska. We acknowledge that the Lincoln peoples have been stewards of the land on which we work and reside since time immemorial, and we are grateful for that stewardship and incredible care. We also recognize that our campuses are adjacent to the ancestral home of the Tkaraz and Simshian, and we commit to serving their peoples with equity and care. We recognize the series of unjust actions that have attempted to remove them from their land which includes forced relocation and the burning of villages. We honor the relationships that exist between the Lincoln, Haras, and Simshian peoples and their sovereign relationships to their lands, their language, their ancestors, and their future generations. We aspire to work towards healing and liberation, acknowledging, recognizing our past are intertwined in the complex histories of colonization in Alaska. We acknowledge that we arrived here by listening to the peoples, elders, lessons from the past, and these stories carry us as we weave a healthier world for future generations. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Diane Hirschberg, Director of the University of Alaska Anchorage Institute of Social and Economic Research to introduce our guest tonight. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, there are some people in the room who know that my journey in Alaska started here um, in 1991 on a, 92 maybe it was, on a national study of detracking and racially mixed secondary schools that included a school in Southeast. And so when I come to Juneau, I, I do feel like I'm at home um, and, um, and although I love being in Anchorage, um, I, there's a big part of my heart that is here. So thank you for welcoming us here. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tuya Turinen to you. She is from the University of Lapland, which is in Finland, right on the Arctic Circle. Um, she serves in a whole bunch of roles there. She is Dean of Education and the head of their teacher education program. She's also you are to chair for um, teacher uh, in education for social justice and diversity, and then she's head of our thematic network, which is um, a group of faculty from um, and researchers from all across the north who work um, on these issues of uh, teacher education for social justice and diversity. Um, and a little plug I want to put in, you might have noticed a flyer when you came in. We, our thematic network has recently produced a book um, that uh, is an open access book um, from Springer. So we're hoping you'll take a look at this to, to see the work, not only that we've done, but our colleagues from across the north. Um, we are fortunate to be working together um, in this case, on um, an exchange that was funded by the U.S. Embassy in Helsinki. And uh, I was, had an amazing experience spending a month in Finland, and now Dr. Turinen is here um, uh, spending three weeks in Alaska. And as part of that, sharing with us um, what does it mean to, to teach and learn uh, in Finland, because there are many, many lessons for us. And so I'm um, excited to get to hear this today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Julia. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Diane. Yes, and thank you for having me here. It has been a pleasure. We have been a uh, couple of days here in Juno, and the weather is just beautiful, and the landscape is awesome. So it has been really, really nice trips uh, so far. And uh, I came to Alaska about three weeks ago and I'm heading back to home on, on Wednesday. 
So this has been a very, very good trip indeed. And with all those things, I also want to highlight the UNESCO Unit Wind Network, which we are also, also part of. So in our University of the Arctic Thematic Network, we work for three main themes, uh, inclusion, uh, indigenous education, and uh, rural education and digital solutions and digital learning. Uh, and uh, that is for the North, North. And then we have the same network, but we have members from Global South, New, New Zealand, Australia, <laughs> Ethiopia, uh, Lithuania might be the countries. Yes, and you've probably heard a lot about Finnish education, and I know that uh, Professor Basi is uh, has been in many places and talked about uh, Finnish education, and uh, I might say, uh, say the similar kind of kind of things. He has, uh, um, has uh, done lots of research on um, um, politics of of education in a large scale. But I also speak from the teacher educator point of view, from my own university, which is not a central university in Finland, but we are 800 kilometers away from our capital area to north. So that is maybe, maybe a little difference there. So first, a little insight of what Finland actually is. We are a tiny, small country. And I learned that Alaska is uh, bigger than Europe, so we are a little tiny country. We are located here, and this is our capital area, and Rovaniem is somewhere here, and Norway, Norway is here, and Sweden is there. And this is our big, <laughs> big neighbor, Russia. Uh, our population is 5.5 million. We are not many. And uh, uh, in southern parts of our country, we have quite density in population, but uh, when you go up north and uh, north, less and less people. And in Lapland, we have more reindeer than people. <laughs> and we have, I think, one square kilometer per each other. So we, we, have, we have space here, as you have here in Alaska. So this is the kind of similar, similar thing. Uh, we have two official languages. Finnish and Swedish. I don't go to the history of that, uh, that, but that is the case. And then we have indigenous people, indigenous Sami, people living, they live in Norway, another Norway or, or Norway, Sweden, Finland and Russia. And three, and all, all lang Sami languages, I think it's eight or nine living languages. And in Finland, Three languages are spoken, North Sami, uh, Inari Sami, and Skolp Sami. And, and so these are the local languages. People with foreign background, about 7.5% of the whole population. And education level is fairly high. So 9% of our population have done the basic education uh, within, from year, year one to or till they are 16 or 18. 44% uh, have upper secondary education, meaning till uh, 18, 20. And then 45, nearly half of the population have tertiary, tertiary education, meaning higher education. Higher education, uh, either in uh, universities of applied sciences, which is more hands on, like, like nursing and, and those kind of things, or then at the universities, which is more theoretical. And this has, uh, has this is quite a purposeful strategy, uh, which started uh, 50, 60 years ago, because we don't, we are few, and we don't have many uh, richness in our country. So people are, are the part that is worth of, worth of uh, paying attention. And then just briefly, our education system. Uh, Early childhood education, and here I rather call it early childhood education than childcare, because it's in, in what, uh, it's very important part of education system and, and the, the lifelong learning it starts with early childhood education. The maternity or parental leave uh, uh, lasts till the, the baby is nine or ten months old, and parents can share that as they as they wish. 
And then uh, the, young, the youngest kids in our early childhood education are usually uh, 10 months or, or 12 months. Both of my kids were started their early childhood education when they were 10 months old. Uh, then uh, we have pre-primary education, which is quite un unique. I think Sweden has the same thing, and, and we and um, we often call this, or we call this, is preschool. But then uh, internationally, the preschool doesn't make sense because all of this is preschool. Uh, so uh, it's pre-primary education, and uh, one year uh, in the year they turn six is uh, compulsory for the families and it's also free of charge uh, for the families and now we are piloting two years uh, pre-primary education and uh, uh, with this inflation what which we are, are, are having at the moment i think uh, right it might take some time till we have that part is established and that actually happened with our pre the one year pre primary, it uh, started with the 1990 uh, something. The, uh, there was this, how do you call that? Uh, economic downturn. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So it took took a time, so it might well be so. But yes, so the pre primary education is uh, free of charge, as all is as all our education is, from, uh, from pre-primary to, to the whole, throughout the whole thing. And, uh, and it's play-based. So the kids are, uh, are playing and, and, and doing hands-on things, lots of outside time, outside playing time. And, uh, and when they, the, the year they turn seven, they start the, the comprehensive school. And that is one difference that our uh, our kids do go. They go to school later than in in many countries. And before that, it's play based, but it is education. It's not nursing or or or, or, or childcare. And then yes, nine nine years of comprehensive school, and then uh, the uh, kids can choose either the academic way, which is the matricula which ends up with the matriculation examination. It's a general upper secondary school, or they can go more to the profession, so uh, the vocational education and, and and training. And if they don't know what to do. They have the option of doing this one um, one year or shorter time uh, where they think think and have some some experience what the, what the work life is. And just a couple of years ago, our basic uh, our, our basic education or or the comprehensive comprehensive education uh, included this secondary level. That is fairly new, and that was because of the pandemic. We were losing our young young people. We were losing our young people, and uh, and uh, uh, had to think that what do we need to do that we keep them on track. Most of the kids did fine, and most of the kids came back to school, but not everybody. So for those ten, it was growing ten percent. It was under ten percent before the pandemic, but it was uh, going up with numbers. So it was decided that to catch that group, we will have this compulsory education till they turn to 80. So they have to go somewhere after the comprehensive school. And the comprehensive school is actually uh, looks after the kids where they go. So that, that, that's, that is their responsibility. Then from, uh, from the secondary education, uh, kids can go to the either universities, to the bachelor, or they can go to the University of Applied Sciences, which is more a hands-on thing, and do the bachelor. And then they can, uh, in the academic uh, range, they can continue the universities, do the masters, or the bachelor is already already in the university, continue at the universities, do the masters, or they can go to the uh, from the universities of, of applied sciences to universities to do the academic master. 
or vice versa. They can do the masters at the university and then go to the University of, of Applied Sciences and even do a bachelor there. Everything is, is possible and these, these are changing. And then there is the uh, uh, doctoral degree, PhD at the end. And the thing in our education system is that there, there are no dead ends. So whatever you choose, you can always change your mind and do it, do, uh, uh, choose something different. And then I have here a little video which is about our education system, how I end the show. And go from here. And this should work. It worked 30 minutes ago. So. We think that our society is safe and, and we are looked, up, looked after. And, uh, and as the uh, video said, we have the free education and it includes the free hot lunch for the kids uh, this, this, to the end of secondary level every day. And that is, uh, I think that that is something because at least at school they have a healthy lunch, with, which is. Um, has uh, wedges and greens, uh, greens in, in, in it, and they they learn this uh, this healthy diet at school. And at the universities, we have the un our union. Our students pay pay now uh, it's two euros uh, seventy cents. So it might be what is that? So right now, it's about three dollars. Three dollars per uh, for a meal, and it's a proper 
me on not a hamburger or, or pizza. <laughs> it is not, not uh, shown in our, our cafes. So the, that they, uh, they need some substitutes by the, by the government. Uh, so what are the things that we don't do in Finland? Our education system uh, is flexible, there is no dead ends, and we try to support all the learners um, to, do, uh, to do their best and find their, <coughs> or, um, not, to find their place in the world and in the society. And uh, we don't have special education schools, uh, only for those who need um, uh, supporting, uh, for, for example, from some, for some uh, they, uh, they don't see or something like that, they, are, they might be a couple of weeks in a special school per year so that they can have um, the support, the very special support they need. But other than that, they are in the normal, normal schools. And, uh, and uh, special education teachers most often work together with the, the primary school teacher or, or the the subject teacher in the school. So there are two, two teachers in the classroom uh, working with the kids. We don't have school inspections, not any kind. They used to be around when I was, I was at school, but not, not anymore. So um, our teachers, uh, they don't uh, have to be uh, prepared. The schools don't, don't have to be prepared for any kind of external um, uh, accreditation, for example. We have an, an agency in Finland who is doing the evaluation, but that's a supportive evaluation and it's done together with, uh, uh, with the institution, not to check if they are qualified or, or not. And that, I think, is a, one of the big differences we have with you. And also in our higher education, uh, we have we have these every now and then these uh, uh, audits, but it's not accreditation. So we are not uh, we don't have to be afraid that we lose lose some some degree or something. We don't do any national testing, and I have been here. Uh, <laughs> this this month is the national testing. That's what I have learned. That is the testing going on, so all the things needed to done last week or the other week because then the testing weeks are coming and, and so on. But we don't do that. So that is also takes a quite heavy weight from the teachers. They don't have to teach for the tests. They teach for the kids and they teach for the for the for the kids, kids learn, what need. We don't have any school fees in comprehensive schools. Nothing. They, it's not allowed to collect any any money from the parents. So anything that happens in the school must be free of charge. Then the uh, kids can decide that they do some some um, fundraising, for example, for the school trip to to some nice place or something. But that's then done together with the kids. The first they decide what the, what the funding is needed for, how much, and then do the planning and, and, and so on. And in higher education, we don't have any tuition fees. Not in any level. The PhD program is also free of charge. So it's really an um, open, open system that uh, if you want to do your studies, you don't your parents or anybody don't have to pay for that. Of course you have to pay for your living and accommodation and, and so on, but even for that our students have um, a little grant from the government. It's always too little. That's what, that's what I have learned in 20 years. I am even more. We had the grant when I was at school and uh, higher education and it was too small, so it's, they're, they're always complaining about that, but that's fine. So what then we do in, in Finland, uh, teaching career is highly valued in Finland. And just uh, last week I got the numbers, the uh, application time uh, period ended, and I got the numbers for our um, teacher education program, how many applicants we have. We take in 90. 
uh, and we had, I think, 600 applications. So, so, uh, and, uh, so we can choose from, from them, uh, them, them. And why the teaching career is so highly valued? Because it's been in a discussion that what is the reason for that? And one reason might be that in old times uh, there, uh, so there were small communities and there were only very few educated people, priest, teacher, and a lawyer or something like that. So that might might tell something like something about that. But yes, young people want to become the choose the teaching career as a profession. Uh, majority of our teachers hold a master's degree. And our teacher education uh, is a research-based program, so they first do the bachelor degree and piece of empirical research as part of that, and then they uh, complete the master's degree with a little bit bigger uh, with part of research uh, as part of their uh, career. And only the um, early childhood education teachers, they are bachelors. And that is immediately then we can see it in the salary, in the working conditions, and, and so on. So I think that one answer now looking back to Finland uh, and seeing that these are the bachelor teachers in early childhood education, uh, and all, uh, all the others have masters. And that makes a difference in the society. And when it was decided that uh, all teachers will have the masters, uh, that was a very wise decision, and it, it was made in 1970s. So it's not that uh, that long long time ago. And the early childhood education teachers are really now saying that they also want to be masters. And now the leaders of the early childhood education centers they need to have masters in, in educational sciences, bachelor in early childhood education, and then masters in educational sciences. Uh, salary is uh, well about the national median salary. I checked this before I came here, and uh, this is from last year, from 2022, uh, 2022 uh, the number. So uh, teachers, um, they you don't become rich to be a teacher, but it's a good profession with a with a fairly good salary. And these teachers are also trusted and respected professionals. And we start to build up this uh, professional identity, or we start to build up the professional identity uh, when they start their studies. <coughs> and now you are part of this, uh, this te te teacher's professional group, and uh, uh, learning, learning to grow in your profession from the very first year. Uh, when they come, the first thing that they do when they come to our our education pro program in University of Lapland is that they look back in their own life and see what was the path to the teacher education, and they think about good examples of uh, very good teachers they have had and, and think the learnings, and they also build up start to build up their pro uh, professional portfolio in teaching. The curriculum development is in major part uh, and locally by the teachers. Teachers are a very important part of the curriculum making. We have what we call a national core curriculum, uh, which uh, sets the frame what is uh, what is needed to be done. But then uh, the local um, teachers are making their, their own curriculum uh, in in small areas like the Rovaniemi city, I think that Rovaniemi has one, one curriculum. And it is different from when we go up north from Rovaniemi with the, and we come near to uh, Sami homeland uh, border, then the curriculum is, is, a, is a bit, little bit or, or different. And teachers are important, and this is what they also uh, learn from the very beginning of their studies that the curriculum is uh, for them to make and they need to understand the national core curriculum but they also need to have a critical stance on it 
because they are the ones who are then, then also taking part in developing the national core curriculum. And if the teachers don't have the critical stance that oh, we don't think that this is good or this should be this and this, who is then saying that? Policymakers? But they are not professionals in education. And teachers can decide quite freely their pedagogical approaches. And as much as possible also their teaching materials. Or of course the study books, if uh, they need to be bought and, and teachers can't say that, okay, I, this year I want this and this year I want that because that costs money. But any other materials they are free to, free to use and also the pedagogy is the teachers to choose. And that makes uh, teachers, uh, uh, the different teachers' classes very different. So the same like year seven teaching can look very different in different classes because of the, of the teacher. And they certainly don't have to be at the same page at the same time. Uh, then what we are now working with is a program which is called what was called right to learn it ended at the end of last year so the the learnings are now gathered from from this but this started uh, or it started just before the pandemic and it was really underlined uh, then uh, like the pandemic really make a, a strong un underlining to this so that we need to make the education suitable for all the equal conditions for learning parts for everybody. And part of this was that uh, we extended the, uh, the compulsory education. And equality, having all as much as needed support, support as early as possible. That is uh, the, uh, a big thing. And with that, we want to reduce the learning gap, so the differences between the groups, between the uh, socio-economical background or gender or geographical uh, uh, background. So this is the thing that we want to reduce those gaps as much as possible. Doing the basic skills uh, so that they are strong. And this is interesting because we tend to think that we know what the basic skills are. Reading, writing and mathematics, right? But then the question is that, are they really? And this is my critical standard. What are the basic skills actually today and in 20 years time? And that is something that we really need to think about even we do teacher education because our teachers when they start in our program which is five year program um, if they start in next autumn 2023 uh, they will graduate 2028 and then they will stay in profession hopefully uh, 40 years 30, 40, 60, 70 till 30, 78. So what are the basic skills when we look at the future? And I might say that, uh, that uh, the knowing the, the spelling correctly might not be the basic skill. Because I think that these boards which we have, and not this one, but lots of them, they actually will correct you your writing. In, 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 uh, they do already. I write a lot in English, English is not my first language, I do a lot of mistakes, but it's so nice because it's, it's doing the corrections for me. What a nice thing to, to have. Um, maybe we actually need to have one of the basic skills is the critical thinking mm -hmm. and understanding that uh, you always need to check where the answer is coming. The world is full of answers like this chat TV, DOBT, people, <laughs> this, it gives you an answer. And all the other things gives you an answer. Google gives you an answer. But you need to think that what is the, what do you think about this answer? Is it right? Or can you have a, what, what point of thinking is the answer coming from? Would you have a, a deep, very opposite answer to the same question if you think it from the other ways wrong? And these are the things that we, 
really uh, want, uh, want to develop in our, our teacher education program. And I think that we at the moment have two or three courses which are media literacy, critical thinking, critical reading skills, which might be the, actually the basic skills in the future. Uh, uh, yes, literacy and then new literacy skills which are these critical thinking and, and so on. And support for all children, so that the support is available for them, their parents know their rights. Oh, that is the thing that we still have to work with, that the parents are aware of all the support that is actually available. Uh, this is an, uh, it's easily said, but uh, easily also, also forgotten. Inclusion, meaning in very broad sense, so that inclusion is not only the having special education kids in the classrooms, but also uh, valuing all the backgrounds that people are coming from linguistic, cultural background. Multiprofessional cooperation, so that uh, uh, it, it, is, um, it links with the support and accessibility, so that the professionals come to schools and work with teachers and, 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 and how the cooperation co stand to the, to the problems. And now we have uh, a social worker in all our schools, and that also came with this uh, right to learn program, a little before all that, actually. And that is a learning curve for, for teachers, so that the, because teachers are used in all countries. They are used to lead, set the same framework, and now you do this, you do that, and you do that. Please stay, or stay and wait, I will come back to you later. Those kind of you, everybody knows that. And then there comes the social worker, who are not used to that kind of thing. They are used to look, think, uh, reflect, and if the teacher don't understand, teachers don't understand the different profession, like a social worker, they might never stop to actually listen or have a professional discussion with this other profession. And that is very interesting. We have a, a, a course where we have all our faculties in, involved. So our teachers, students, student teachers, then uh, uh, visual art teachers, student teachers, lawyers, future lawyers and future social workers. They come to the same course. And then we give them case, cases, and they have to work on those cases. And, and they often say, oh, they start with the, saying that, oh, but there are too many teachers in all the groups. Yes, they are. And that's, that's also the social workers' life in the future. There are many teachers. And then only one or two social workers, or only, one, only maybe one. Uh, law expert who is participating in the discussion. And it's also learning for the student teachers. Hey, these are the other professions you need to uh, recognize and need, need to listen to and, and understand this, uh, uh, this in many different uh, aspects. Yes, and as early as possible, as much as needed. And then strengthening the teaching quality. And we have qualified teachers. But what we have to work on is the professional development in, during the teaching career. And that is, uh, it's a work, in, a work in progress. And uh, we had a project, it was especially related to this, and, and find out that, yes, this is, uh, we need a, a structured professional development program for, for teachers. And then also the, uh, how to implement the curriculum and how to find the most important things. Uh, many studies say that the study books the, what the, are used in the classroom actually set the curriculum. And this is something, a, a thing that we are educating our teachers, that you don't have to follow the study book. But what you have to follow is your own curriculum the local curriculum, that is the one that you need to follow, not the study book. And it doesn't matter if you don't fill every page. And then, of course, there is a point where you come to think that do I actually need all these study books? Or could I use other materials 
in, in Spain. And these are the things that which are, which are core principles in our Finnish education system. Integrative learning means that we make a project with these many, many subjects in, in one at elementary level. That's easy because there is this uh, one teacher working throughout the class. But in at secondary uh, level and, and middle, middle school level, it takes uh, cooperation between teachers. And that is again a, a um, work in progress in Finland. I know that there have been news uh, around the world that all the education now in Finland is a project based. That is not true. We have still mathematics, we have the literature, Finnish literature, we have languages, all that. But part of uh, education is a project based. At least uh, a couple of weeks per, per year. And, and also in the in, uh, in the, the academic level, secondary education uh, is, is working on that. Active learning, so the kids are actively hands-on doing things most of the time. The, they are trying out, they are, they are uh, uh, interviewing kids uh, or, or finding out, may, making the planning for, for something. One of my master's students did very interesting research projects. It was about um, something like it was it something like diversity was the diversity how young young children understand diversity or something like that. And, uh, and it's quite it's not easy. And then what she actually did she went to year uh, the kids who were year five I think so they were eleven. She first went to the class and talked with the kids. Uh, uh, what do you think is this, is this diversity? Diversity was not the thing, but something like that, very abstract. What do you think? What does it mean? And then they, they had the discussion, they, they collected some, some information and background information, and they came out with the list of the, what this actually mean. And then these 11 year old kids made those as a, um, uh, as a interview questions for year one kids, so seven to eight year old kids. And that became interesting because they had to then to, to turn out the very abstract, still abstract things, the things that a seven year old kids can understand so that they can have a discussion about diversity. And that, that was very nice, beautiful, beautiful thing and very good example of this active learning. You can easily have a lesson about diversity and tick the box. But that was a project and I think that those, especially the, uh, the older ones, they really learn, they learn how to, how to understand, uh, the, understand the, the thing and they learn how to actually co collect information on that. Very important is sustainability. I think that is for everybody. Nowadays we have uh, what we have called green flag schools where they are especially concentrate on sustainability. Learning to learn rather than having right answers because answers you can have the world is full of answers and information. That is not the thing but learning to learn and being critical. And then building up learning communities where everybody is learning. Also the teacher is learning together with the, with the kids. And then we also have, uh, it has been around for quite a few years now, teacher education forum. It was established in 2016 and it brought up together all uh, universities who, which actually have teacher education. And um, it was to be end at the end of last year, but was extended with one year because it has been very, very successful. So much so that I now know really uh, the <coughs> what the, uh, what, who are my colleagues as the deans of ed ed faculty of education, and I can ask them next to anything 
But last week I was asking them that we, because we have craft as part of our teacher education program, and uh, about the technical support, how what kind of arrangements are there in different teacher education institutions for technical support for craft university lecturer? And I got the answers, and now they are tabled, and we will meet next. After Easter, we will meet in Romania and probably continue because it's the budget thing. How much <laughs> I need to budget for that, and what uh, what is actually the reality? What other others are, are doing? And uh, the aim was to bring the teacher educators together and also reform the pre service introductory and in service teacher education. And what we then uh, end up, and I'm quite proud of this. It's in Finnish, doesn't matter. Oops. Mm. Uh, this is a network for teacher educators in Finland. And just, uh, just today I, I heard that there is continuous funding from mini the Minister of Education and Culture for this network. And it's, uh, uh, this is the, where they, they had the uh, uh, information about the new materials and, and the things that happen in teacher education. And this is shared learning. Uh, learning uh, curve. And this is says that, hey, teacher educator, welcome to join us in professional development in teacher education. We didn't have like, this before, so this is brand brand new, very exciting thing. And we go back to this, uh, this one. So these are the main uh, things we are developing in our teacher education, uh, extensive basic competencies, it should be expertise and agency to create new innovations. That is very important part of our teacher education program because uh, we see our teachers as, um, as agencies for the uh, reform in our reforms in our teacher, uh, in our society and continuous development, personal competencies and the community. So, so these are the things that, things that we, are, we are working really and I, I think this, that this one, this, this one is very, very important because without that, the, the, what happens is that school becomes a place which actually reproduces the same society as it has always been. Because school, schools can also be a place where you have the change happening. But then we have the other side of the coin, and here is a this is a free online uh, or free uh, open access book, and uh, just very briefly to show you about the uh, that everything is not perfect <laughs> in Finnish society. Uh, in my famous education system, unvanished, unvarnished, it's probably insights into Finnish schooling. And as you can see, it's open, open access. And if I look this, I think that it then, yes, takes you into the book. And just a quick look of the uh, chapters here. Uh, lots of free word uh, and contents. So you see that many things that we still need to work uh, work on uh, on ecological sustainability, for example, unmentioned challenges of teacher Finnish teacher education, very good one, teachers' accept expectations and, uh, and expect expectations of teachers, uh, and businessing around comprehensive education. Also, the Sami uh, uh, Sami education is is here mentioned. I was the I was the uh, author in this one. So the Sami language online education outside the Sami homeland new pathways to social justice. The last one, but uh, here you can see that it's not it's an, it's not perfect system and in, if we end up one day saying that yes now our education system is ready 
that is a bad day. <laughs> because uh, we, we never done ready, but there's all, always things we can we can do. But as you can see, divided cities, divided uh, schools. So different school areas have different the differences with the, between the school the schools. Racism in Finnish uh, school textbooks. This is quite interesting one or rainbow paradise sexualities and gender diversity in Finnish schools. But please, you can explore this. This is a, it's an interesting reading, especially when you probably have heard uh, a lot of other kind of stories that there's always a thing to get better. And then, kiitos. Thank you for listening. And I'm, I'm happy to have other comments or questions or, or anything. I'm happy to, uh, to respond and also the online audience. Yes, please. Thank you. I'm just very curious about how education is funded in okay. um, yeah. It's uh, funded. Uh, municipalities uh, uh, are responsible for the education, and taxes are collected for covering that. And then there's also some some government funding coming to the municipalities. But it's both uh, government level and then the local. Level. Yes, please. I was curious, you were saying how teachers can do their own pedagogy and classrooms are very different. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could give examples of how very different those could be. Like I can imagine there could be some pedagogies that you'd be like, no, you're not, no corporal punishment. No. <laughs> but what are, could you explain a little bit of how different classrooms could be within one school, for instance? Uh, for example, um, uh, how, how you teach to the, reading for the little kids. Mm -hmm. That can vary uh, a lot. Some teachers have um, uh, a very whole, whole oh word, uh, word approach and some, the Finnish language is, um, uh, uh, we say it as it is written. So it's actually the decoding is kind of the way to understand. And then once you know how this letters are set, set, then you can decode it easy, easily. So in that sense, Finnish is very easy language. But teachers can choose very different approaches. And that's, I think, one of the um, biggest choices choose they can make. Uh, and, and anything. But yes, no with the, or no religious education is allowed, or of course, this punishment and, and so on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I might add, when I've seen in two different places where teachers were given some money to actually be able to redesign the learning spaces mm -hmm. and to have, you know, to, to work with architects on flexible learning environments. Mm -hmm. And so I've, um, mm -hmm. both when we were at, at FIRA, which is the Finnish Education mm -hmm. Research Association mm -hmm. Conference, and in the lab school that, that mm -hmm. is by, um, uh, in the world of NIMI, you know, having teachers work on creative ways to open up the classrooms, mm -hmm. knock off the knock out the walls. I mean, some of us are old enough to remember open classrooms in the seventies. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but again, experimenting with that, and those are all teacher designed yeah. efforts with teachers doing mm -hmm. research on how this mm -hmm. is working with their students. Yes, it's a kind of research approach to your work and, and have, again, a critical reflection on your own work. Is this working or is this not working? What should I do differently? So, yeah. Yes, please. Do families get to choose what district or what school they would like their children to go to? It sounds mm -hmm. like the teachers have a, a wide a variety of methods that they can use, or do you know what neighborhood schools? Yeah. Yes, yes and no. So the, uh, the nearest school is, uh, uh, is a uh, free option for the families, and uh, 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 the school, uh, transportation to school is provided to the nearest school. But if the uh, parents don't want their kids to that school, they have to apply to the other school and they take them in if there's a school for that. But then the 
uh, parents have to organize the transportation. And uh, in some cases, like for the family moves in, inside, for example, in Romaniemi to other area, so then they might want to they teach to be in the old classroom, for example, to the end of the elementary education. And then they are responsible. They can have that, that's probably fine because the kids have been there, but they have to do all the organizing, the transportation, and so on. But usually the kids go to the nearest school. Yeah, I have some questions online. Yes. I had a chance to hear some of your remarks last week on a panel, and so this may be a little unfair because it was a slightly different presentation, mm -hmm. but there were some broad differences about the approach in the traditional Sami land homelands mm -hmm. and southern part. Can you touch on that? Yes, and that is the chapter which is uh, in the book. Uh, about the Sami homeland. So yes, so in Sami land, which is a uh, homeland area, which is up north of Finland, the Sami, background, Sami children have right to have all their education in their own language. But outside of that Sami homeland area, the Sami children are not invited to that. Uh, the, um, the municipality can still organize that. And for example, in Helsinki, they have a Sami class, in Oulu they have, and in Rovaniemi there is a Sami, at least Sami early childhood education. But outside of that Sami homeland area, the Sami children are, can uh, join the uh, extracurriculum uh, online Sami language classes. And that is uh, not uh, okay. And that is what the chapter is, uh, is about. Yes, you are right. Yes? Um, the first question is, is there an upper age limit cut off for the education programs? So for people that are like getting the master's, PhD, if those are covered, um, if they don't have to pay tuition for them? Does it matter how much No. No. Okay. No. No. <laughs> no. You can have gray hair and still yes. <laughs> yes, there is a discussion going on that how many degrees the government is actually paying. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you want to have uh, your sixth or seventh degree, it might be fair for you to pay something. But that is a big, big discussion. And, and I don't know, will it happen because it starts it touches one of the, our basic understanding of how our education system and our, our society is working. But the next question online is, if you're not doing national testing, do the teachers have their own formative testing to keep track of student learning in the classroom? Yes, yes, of course. So the teachers, the formative uh, assessment is a big part of the assessing process in Finland. Uh, they just also do the some some of the some of the so at the end of the uh, some, something mathematic thing they they have the, the test to check but the formative assessment throughout the, the learning process is the most important one and it need to be it need to have different kinds of of uh, assessment uh, uh, types. That is actually uh, said now in our, our basic education act that uh, assessment can't be only a written test, but it has to uh, has different different part, parts of of, of that uh, assessment. But that is very important because only with that formative assessment throughout the learning, the teachers can have access to to do the right pedagogical choices with the children. If you don't know what is happening there you can't help the, the, the kids in the learning. And that's also the case in higher education, as much as possible. It depends on how many students we have in our, our courses. And then the last question online is, <clears throat> what were the ages of children <clears throat> starting the education system? And what percent of the population might speak Russian? Oh, so the age of uh, kids uh, starting their education is when they now is when they turn to six. 
So that is when they have to go to this what we call preschool, so pre-primary education at the moment. We have Russian speaking, um, speaking population. I can't give the numbers, but if you go to the more east you go in Finland, the more of Russian speaking people we have in, in the country. But I think that Russian is um, one of the biggest uh, languages spoken in, in Finland. Yes? Can you describe a common structure for um, teachers' day um, and if they like common time to plan a meet together or prep time or are they on with the kids all day long or how how how's that work? I can give you, I can give an example from my family because I think that there is no exact <laughs> exact exact form for, for that. So my husband is a primary school teacher, and his teaching usually starts at eight a.m. Uh, so he is usually at school for at least twenty two eight <clears throat> eight, and then he has the classes. Uh, there are breaks during the classes, and uh, during those breaks, he sometimes goes out to, with children and sometimes doesn't. Then there is a lunch break with the longer uh, outdoor playing time for the kids, and then the afternoon classes, and uh, with some breaks there. Uh, there might be a teacher's meeting. I think that's once once per week they have the whole school teachers meeting and after school we might uh, come to home do something and then go back for to meet parents or sometimes he is home at 1 p.m and sometimes he is home at 4 or 5 depending on what is happening after school uh, day uh, for the kids the school days are usually over by two or three PM. He's uh, teaching grade five this year, so it depends on on, on what what year he, uh, they are teaching. But yes, they, uh, there are no hours that uh, uh, he. Of course, he has to be there when <laughs> the lessons and the the meetings are. But other than that, it's quite flexible on how how he wants to work, basically. And then the planning time, uh, I would say it starts six thirty in our morning, with our morning coffee, <laughs> <laughs> and ends up seven p.m. when we are kind of okay now we close close <laughs> <laughs> of the close of the school. So it's kind of in the continuous critical uh, reflections. And because I'm not, I I used to work as a teacher and teacher education and teaching pedagogy is my uh, Area, so we are very bad on closing the school doors, as we, as we say. Yeah. We can throw a couple more online questions. Yeah. Also. Uh, what is the composition of students with different cultural backgrounds? Mm, um, it really depends on the area. So um, in South Finland, there might be schools that there are uh, like. Um, Many many languages spoken and, and many many people. But then you, when you come to Rovaniemi, uh, it's not uh, so much. Um, but there are always um, it, it, is, it is increasing. But I can't say the exact number of the statistics. And even if I say so, it depends on the on the area and the school a lot. And the next one is what sequence of events tied the Ministry of Education with culture? I don't quite understand the question. I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a native speaker in English, so what does my mean? The one slide showed them as a, a together agency. Oh, the, it's, it's the Ministry of Culture and Education? I think you're asking how did that get married together? This one. No. no. Was there something that showed the next one? one? Was that one with the lion? Oh, yeah. a cat. No. <laughs> no. 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 How about the one after the clouds? Uh, number nine? This. 
No, um, go down to number nine. Yeah. Uh, Ministry yeah. of Education and Culture. Yes, yeah, so Ministry of Education and Culture was the body that uh, that asked us to be together, but uh, instead of being uh, kind of uh, supervising, they were working with us for the teacher education. Right, but I think what the question is, well, they how is it to follow up and <laughs> say, your government has the two tied. I was wondering if that was in response to cultural diversity, which is why I asked. How long has it been the Ministry of Education and Culture? Do they used to be separate? No. So they've mm -hmm. always been educational uh, uh, and culture? Uh, not probably always, but yeah. long time. Yeah. Yes, and sport is part of this ministry. Sometimes, yeah, yes. So, and sometimes we have two ministers. One of them is for basic com comprehensive education, and the other one is for higher education. And sometimes there is a person for culture as well. And it depends on the government. Yes. Yep. Um, so here we have a school system that has like nine months. We're off in the summertime. Mm -hmm. um, could you speak to like? structure year-round structure and um do you incorporate naps do you incorporate snacks you said that the lunches are mm -hmm. free but mm -hmm. is there anything else that based on the age development that that you've noticed is different from here mm -hmm. So yes, the school year is pretty much the same. We have the summer off, and I uh, at one school we can figure out figure out that the one school that I was visiting, then they more or less the same, and the uh, uh, school days per uh, year are more or less the same. Uh, and the yes, the school lunch I think is the very little big difference, uh, and then the snacks um, it, uh, that is not very common so it is the lunch but then the school day ends usually uh, for younger ones uh, even 1 p.m and then they might go to the afternoon club and there is a snack available for the older ones uh, uh, the school days and uh, by 3 p.m so the the, the the school days vary for the kids in in week so one Monday they might have on from nine to three, and Friday from eight to twelve. My sense was there's much more time spent in outdoors or in physical education. Um, well, and if I'm thinking about Anchorage School District, where they nearly did away with recess and outdoor playtime after lunch, you know, that's been a huge controversy. That they've increased lunch from 20 minutes to 30 minutes was a, a huge fight for that. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, children were being sent out sometimes for as long as an hour mm -hmm. um, to be playing on the playground. Um, and I don't know if that was every day, but um, definitely longer yeah. focus on and more focus on physical well being mm -hmm. as part of the whole learning environment. Mm -hmm. Yes. I guess since you also have a pot of teachers, mm -hmm. I guess I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One, if, if there's more focus on outdoor play and there's play curriculum early on, uh, then I'm wondering if teachers in the schools plan for recess and play, like is there intention, intentionality behind their recess? Mm -hmm. And then my second question would be, um, <clears throat> Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the early childhood education has a, uh, has a uh, curriculum and it has a uh, very strong play, play, play there, but the recess times are, are free time for the kids. So they, they can choose what they do. So there is not much planning. But having said that, now we have um, in many schools the kids are doing the planning for some recess times, and they invite those who want to join uh, to to join these activities. But recess is is a break from from learning the own own individual time, as you have a coffee break and lunch break at work. So that is a similar kind of thing. But, but I did see that the children were learning at lunchtime. There was a group of mm -hmm. kids that rotate through who surf, mm -hmm. 
help cook and clean mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. So there's a pedagogical aspect yes, even yes. to lunch. Food. Yes, lunch is uh, actually uh, the lunch time is a bit pedagogical time. Uh, and that's where the, all the habits uh, are, are learned how to uh, create your meal so that you have enough greens and how to have a nice social food, chatting with your friends and, and, and so on. That's better much for time. But the play of uh, the great processes are, um, are not, yes. Do you know, in the um, primary schools, the uh, up to level five or six. Are there specialists? Are there arts teachers, drama teachers, study teachers, yeah. music teachers, or is the classroom teacher doing that? Uh, it depends on school uh, a lot. So, so yes, for many many times for music languages like in English, uh, there is a subject teacher, art teacher might be one. It depends on the variety of the skills of the teachers who are who working in that school. Because the school is yeah. yeah. so let's get a special thing this. No, no, the school is our teachers decide by themselves. So what they want to do. So we've actually gone over the time we've allotted, but we're we're not running off anywhere. So I think I want to um, thank Dr. Turunen and invite those who are here to stay longer if you want to ask us any questions. But otherwise, thank you all. Thank you for those online and uh, for those in the room. Yeah, hang out and we have snacks in the foyer. Seven ten. Seven ten. Seven ten. I think I'll run up.